This is the Man on Second Podcast as part of the 5 Reason Sports Podcast Network. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of the Man on Second Podcast. My name is Eric Wiedeke. As always, I am joined by Joe Frasaro. Uh, how are you doing this Sunday, Joe? Uh, doing great, Eric. Doing great. You know, um... Busy weekend. Uh, the Marlins, as you said, we're recording this on Sunday night. They uh, lost today on Sunday to the Dodgers. Got a game tomorrow. Uh, this podcast will air on Monday. Well, so that'll be before that finale. But uh, ready to go. I mean, what have what kind of caught your eye in the first couple of the games of this series? And uh, obviously, Sandy on Saturday was kind of the story for the Marlins this weekend so far. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess all things considered, uh, through three games, you know, the best thing that I can say is they probably, outside of today's performance, you know, gave the Dodgers a little bit uh, more fight than than I even anticipated uh, going to extras with them on uh, on Friday night and then Saturday, Sandy going the complete game. Uh, I mean, this series kind of comes down to and, you know, and this is something that we're going to kind of segue into here. But, you know, you had Sandy going Sunday and then you had Gonsolin going Monday. Uh, so, you know, you kind of, you have the top two of the Cy Young and that's kind of what everybody, I guess, was looking for in this series where you've got Sandy going one day, what is he going to do coming off of his rough start in LA? Uh, well, we saw it, he went nine innings, uh, another complete game, his fourth of the season, more than any other team in major league baseball, uh, threw in the 10 strikeouts, uh, as well. Cause you know, I, the voters love, the, <laughs> love the punch outs. Uh, but Sandy will take the outs any way you can get him. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how Tony Gonsolin responds tomorrow uh, for for the Dodgers. Gonsolin still first in the NL uh, in ERA, how, and he's got that 16-1 record. Uh, however, he is, I believe, now 45 innings behind Sandy uh, as of right now. We got Sandy at 185 and two-thirds, and Gonsolin going in on Monday – at 128 and a third. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, quite a gap. Uh, it'll be Gonsolin's 24th start. Sandy has 26 already in the books. Uh, but let, let's ask the question. Is Sandy clinched it or not? The Cy Young. No, I wouldn't. I, I Listen, it's August 28th. Uh, the season is running into early October this year. You know, you had to start a little bit later, so we're not quite as late in the season as, as maybe a lot of people think we are. You know, we're going to be running until about October 5th this year, a little bit deeper into October than a lot of people are used to, especially around here uh, this time of year. Uh, I, I I can't say in good faith that, that he's clinched it. He's got to give me he's got to give me at least two or three more starts, get over that 200 inning hump and they've got to be Sandy starts. Uh, because Gonsolin, you know, he's going to continue to put the pressure on whether, you know, we want to talk about the innings or not. It's, it's going to keep happening because he's going to keep pitching well. Uh, and then you've got, you know, other guys that are kind of on the, on the outside looking in, uh, whether that's Edwin Diaz or, I mean, Max Scherzer at this point might even overtake Gonsolin in innings at his rate. Uh, I can't. I can't say that it's clinched yet, but he's close. Yeah, he's he's a front runner in my opinion, but I agree. I don't think he's clinched yet because twenty six starts. He he's probably going to start thirty three. Yeah, thirty two, thirty three. So that's a good six, maybe seven more starts. Um, and the Marlins are shown in no indication that they're going to a six man rotation. If anything, the Dodgers may scale back because Dave Roberts just noted at the in the series when Kershaw comes back in a, in a little bit that they can see going with a six man rotation, but they're being built to go all the way into yep. November if necessary to win the world series. The Marlins really are playing for individual awards and Sandy Alcantara could kind of run out there and go nine uh, if possible. So there's a little bit different objectives, but I'm going to throw another name out there. If you, if you pay any attention to pitching war in fan grass war, San Francisco Giants, oh, right. Carlos Rodon at 12 and 6, 147 innings, averaging uh, 11.55 Ks per nine, a 5.1 F war. Sandy comes in second, 
at a 4.9, and right behind him, Aaron Nola of the Phillies at 4.8, Nola 9 and 10, averaging um, 9.99 Ks per nine. Uh, but I, I just the only thing I could think would hurt Sandy and would be Ks per nine. If people are looking at that, it's 8.10. I, I think that's kind of hogwash. But you know, we we've kind of made it. And I think a lot of voters, if they're not kind of looking at all bodies of work or or making evaluations on the quality of their stuff, they're probably relying on fan graphs and stat cast, and they'll probably make their decisions strictly on numbers rather than you know looking at performance or or value to team or or other factors that that can go into it. Uh, but you know, if Sandy gets up to like in six starts, let's say he averages even six innings a start. And that's kind of on the low end for Standy. That pushes him that what um, another thirty six in innings at one eighty five, almost one eighty six. So yeah, so you got him at what two twenty something, pushing yep. two thirty. That's a big number, you know. And that and I think the volume would work in his favor unless he has a few more four or five run games, and and which could hurt him, you know, if he goes in the seventh inning and gives up five runs the third time through an order, which is, is, I think that affected him one of his starts not too long ago, where it was like the eighth inning, it kind of flipped on him. Um, you know, but uh, otherwise, I, I think the Marlins are looking at their first Cy Young Award winner. And, you know, I we're, we're just trying to make convey that we don't think it's clinched. Uh, who are some of the other candidates? I Diaz is interesting, but do you really name a, a closer when you got starters who – who are building a case because you can build the Tony Gonsolin case. You can build the Carlos Rodon case. Uh, you know, you have, you have Scherzer's numbers in front of you. I, I was just, I wrote a few at the top there. Uh, you know, whether Scherzer is a guy that could get up there. I, I just think that starting pitcher volume is, is going to just, you know, outweigh even uh, the best closer in the game. And let's face it, Edwin Diaz is having a really good year, but this isn't a historical closer year. This isn't a Gagne year where he had the 70 converted without blown save or whatever it was in a row. Um, you know, we're not talking about something like that. Yeah, I mean, as far as as far as that goes, Gagne was actually exactly who I was going to bring up when you brought up uh, <laughs> Edwin Diaz. Diaz is having a great year. Uh, I, I want to give him, you know, as much credit as, as he can get. Uh, he's clearly been the best closer in the game by a good margin. Uh, but this isn't a, this isn't a year where starting pitching has been weak by any means. You know, it, I can see if nobody, you know, is taking uh, the Cy Young award that Diaz might take it, but I think Sandy's been good enough. And the one thing that I will say that I've been pleasantly surprised about, uh, especially in the national media is it does feel like Sandy has has grown in, in spotlight quite a bit. He's getting he's getting the the national push as well. Uh that that a lot of guys like like a Rodon or or a Nola even uh haven't received this year. Uh which I think and and you know, as unfair as it is, that does play a role in it. The the storyline has kind of been built for Sandy already. Uh, and as long as he doesn't collapse down the stretch, I, I do think it's his award to lose. Yeah, I, I could see if the Marlins, if Sandy, to me, if he's you know not giving up a run through six innings, they could pull him out of the game. You know, yeah. he may not get the win; something may affect, affect there. But that's going to lower that ERA. You know that that type of thing. Uh, but you know, it, I guess what I really like about Sandy, and there's a lot, obviously, I like about Sandy. But I just like that he's he's really bringing in a focus, something I think has been kind of lost, and that's the innings pitched. You know, it, it's like people just seem to poo-poo it because we got so accustomed, as we've talked about numerous times on the podcast in the past, blow it out for five innings or six innings. You know, last year, oh, man, Trevor was great for four and two-thirds. He had nine strikeouts, you know. Didn't even qualify for the win because he didn't go five innings. And we got so caught up in strikeouts that, you know, we thought three – Three inning starts. If you had seven strikeouts, was was a great thing. It just it just became strikeouts over anything else. And Sandy kind of showed, like you said, he could get ten k ten k's on Saturday against the Dodgers, go go nine, or he could strike out four or five in nine innings and go nine 
it's whatever kind of he needs to do, you know, that, that's what he does. And, and that's the role. I think the role of the starting pitcher is to put your team in the best chance to win and go as deep into games because over 162 games, you have to log these innings. You can't just rely on your bullpen. Hey, I went five innings. I had a great day. You know, pick it up four innings for me, pen, because yet just, you know, then all of a sudden it depends. It always, always happens. And, you know, there are, there, there, I'm not going to say there's a movement, but I know there are certain teams around the league. They're kind of looking at that third time through the order more, getting your starters conditioned to go deeper more, because all the analytics and data point to that's the problem. You know, yeah. it's not, if you could go, if you go seven innings, great. Well, you're going to have to manage that third time through the order to earn the trust of your manager. And this is more in general for starters, not the cream of the crop, not the, the clear cut, you know, Cy Young uh, favorites, which are probably about six that could be in a conversation because the American league, you got, you got Verlander, you got McClanahan, you know, you, you got players over there, pitchers over there that are really, you know, putting nice numbers up here. You got obviously Gonzalez with the, with the ERA, Sandy with the innings in the ERA. And like I said, the Rodon. So you got, you got these pitchers there that are pitching above everybody. But, you know, as the sport looks to get more out of starting pitching, yes, I don't want to lose the game in the seventh inning trying to force a fourth, fifth starter to go seven innings. But I really do expect my first to second and probably my third starter to be able to do it. Yeah, so I think the thing is when you're, when you're looking at uh, starters towards the back end and the reason why, you know, the sport kind of went away from guys being able to go seven, eight, nine – was just because, you know, especially as you're looking at uh, getting through the order that third time through, like you said, uh, the analytics point to you, that's kind of the problem. And truth be told, there's there's really only, you know, two or three players or two or three pitchers per team that can do that for you anyways. You know, it's like uh, with the Marlins, for example. Um, Eliezer Hernandez was the perfect uh, you know, kind of example of that. You didn't really want him getting to that third time through the order uh, because obviously we, we knew kind of what the numbers bore out when, when that happened. And that's, and that's what makes Sandy really impressive and something that I actually want to ask you because I think this is, this is going to be a very interesting thing to keep an eye on as they manage his innings, not only for this year, but for the future. He is going to be pitching uh, in the World Baseball Classic. And then he's going to be pitching for the Marlins next year, obviously. So there's not going to be a robust offseason for him. I do wonder, like you said, if you do see Sandy start to go five or six towards the end of this year, kind of with an eye towards, okay, well, we know he's going to be pitching in the World Baseball Classic. And we know, you know, we want him to be able to be Sandy next year as well. So how, how do you see the team kind of managing that aspect of things down the stretch? Well, yeah, they just put him on pitching programs anyway. And right. it's not like, you know, they're they're kind of throwing two, three innings in the World Baseball Classic as it is. It's not like the starters traditionally in the, in the Classic aren't going five innings. They would kind of build with spring training. Right. And normally, I don't know how much – um, longer spring training is going to be next year. Normally in a WBC year, I remember one year I was up in Jupiter, probably like 60 days. It seemed like 55 days instead of like 47 or 40, you know, it seemed like a full week more. Um, so the team still dictate. If you remember the last classic when um, uh, Stroman, Marcus Stroman, he basically did a start and then pulled out like he went like two innings for like team USA. And then he pulled out of the, of the, of the tournament went back. I think he tried to come back in and join the rotation. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to really be that much of a factor, you know, more so than anybody else. Now you're also assuming the DR is going to the championship game or right. team USA is going to the championship or Venezuela if Pablo's still here and Pablo pitches for Venezuela. They normally 
the classic is doing the bidding of the the the, the player's team anyway. So you know, it's not so much the innings, it's going to be the intensity. Right. You know, instead of, hey, you know what, I might be working on something and throw 45, 50 pitches, you're building up, but now you're building up to get guys out. Right. You know, so it, it's, it is a little bit different, but I, you know, then next year, and you, know, you could already see it now, and knock on wood, it's not anyone, you know, you don't want anyone hurt, but as soon as a starter gets hurt next year, they're going to blame the WBC. That's, that's just right. how it goes. And just like hitters, the, a lot of them, if you notice, they get a lot of oblique injuries because they're not necessarily getting their swings ready. They're they're coming out, taking a lot more swings. Next thing you know, they have oblique injuries, uh, hamstring injuries, because they're they're pushing themselves. Answer your question, I, I think it will be whoever's the pitching coach next year, whoever's the manager next year, uh, getting with Sandy, depending and hoping that he ends this season you know, at full strength. Get him on a good off season to get him enough rest before he ramps up. But I, I would better answer that when I know how long spring training is going to be and how often the games are. But typically, you're throwing. If it's game one, you might be down for 50, 60 pitches, so you may not go more than three innings anyway. That's that might be five or six for Sandy. I don't, I don't know, fifty, yeah. sixty pitches. <laughs> <laughs> If they're no. not stressful, if they're not stressful. No, no, but I mean, well, you know, he might, he might come out the gate throwing 100, 101. Well, know, guys are doing that. that. That's a given. They're, they're, yeah. There are, the pitchers are coming in ready. Yeah. So it's, it would be more a matter of, you know, the plan in place to not overstretch because you're not going to get, if you get a five inning start later in the tournament, you know, that again, it could be six innings if it's a really low pitch count, but you're basically building to be, if he's supposed to be at 80 pitches at that point of spring, that's right. where they're going to get you. Yeah. You know? So I think a better question is who are these pitching coaches on the WBC teams? Because yes, they're going to do what the, the big league club says, but players by their nature, they're, they're representing their country. They're going to get caught up in a moment and try to win the game, especially if it's a highly emotional game with big crowds and, and a lot of fanfare that they're going to be playing it. But, you know, Sandy is just one of those just durable guys that, yeah. you know, I could see, I think it was for sure. He'd start opening day. I can't imagine any time, you know, any way because no. that's everybody's starter. You would say wouldn't yeah. be ready for opening day. However, you might, you know, look for opening day, four innings, five innings instead of, and then start the season with more of a ramp up rather than, hey, he's going to go seven in game one on opening day. Yeah, no, I, I, I do I do agree with that. Um, now, that's not the only decision uh, that whoever the, the – not the pitching coach uh, in this case, but whoever the manager is next season, whether that's Don Mattingly or somebody else, uh, the first base scenario or situation just got a little bit – uh, I, I guess less murky is a good way to put that. Although you're not getting a lot of answers right now at the position. Uh, but we know one guy that will not be there next year. That's Jesus Aguilar. Uh, he was designated for assignment. He did clear waivers. So anyone is free to sign him. Uh, what do you make of the timing of, of the DFA on Aguilar, Joe? Well, that's the one I take issue with because the, the team was really prepared to do this on August 2nd you know, at the dead, at the deadline. And then literally that night after the trade deadline, Garcia, Avisael Garcia got hurt like in the third inning or whatever. The Marlins were kind of shaping up to, to make a move to, to move Aggie off their roster and, and Garcia gets hurt. Then Cooper got hurt. And then next thing you know, Coop comes back and, you know, they want Lewin to play more. And I just, for the player's sake, uh, when you already knew this was going to happen, um, to give him, yes, you could say, oh, he's, you know, released in time to hook up with another team. Well, if this was done August 10th, let's say, you know, right now, these, these teams in need, uh, they're realistically in the wild card. Philly doesn't seem to have a need. Tampa Bay, where he played before, you know, doesn't seem to have a need. Um, you know, right now, you know, you don't even have the Giants in it. 
uh, you basically have four teams for three spots in the National League, you know, because the Braves are kind of a lock if it's not, if it don't overtake the Mets. You know, you got, um, uh, who else? We got the Cardinals and the Brewers, and then you got the Phillies. So you got, you got them and who, and one of those teams is not going to make it. So you, I just think he wasn't really been, yes, you could say, oh, we, we let him go, but you let him go the, the August 31st, he has to be picked up to be eligible right. for postseason roster. So I don't think the Marlins did him any favors in that regard, uh, you know, because there's just not going to be a lot of teams. If they, again, if you, if you made this move on the 10th, when you're already leaning that way, you're already were in communication with the player, but you know, obviously he's getting well compensated and, you know, obviously he hasn't had a very good year. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what kind of value would have had, but, I think you look better for veteran players in similar boats. I don't know if they're going to look at the Marlins at one of their their most shining moments and how to treat a veteran player who happens to be leading your team in homers and RBIs even in his down year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's definitely kind of peculiar uh, on the timing for for Aguilar. It's one of those things where. Like, like you said, it's something that we, we've known is coming for a long time. Even even down to the player, it, you know, it's it's not like it was a very well-hidden secret uh, that, that he'd gotten blindsided with this. All, all parties knew that this is where this was headed towards. And it just felt like even doing this two or three weeks ago, maybe not even on the second exactly, but you could have done this, you know, a while back. And number one, he would have been – in a better position to find a new team. Number two, he would have been uh, in a better position to get adjusted to whichever new team he goes to if he is to get picked up. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And, and on top of that, there, there's just down the stretch. There are bats that that Jesus Aguilar is getting. That I, and I understand with injuries, you know, who else is going to take the at bats? Uh, I, I understand that argument. But from from a from an organizational standpoint, you're in evaluation mode right now. You know, you're not you're not in. Hey, let's let's try to let's try to win 65 games as opposed to 60 or or 70 games as opposed to 68. You're you're in evaluation mode right now. And I know the players on the field want to win, and I'm not advocating that that the players you know not try to win of course they ought to because they are being evaluated to see who's going to be on the team next year uh but just from an organizational standpoint i didn't understand you know keeping him on the roster when you know you know everybody knew what was coming it just it just felt like you dragged it out unnecessarily well you could have also put Encarnacion at first, you know, yeah, exactly. if you a right-handed, if you wanted more, you know, depth at first base with Cooper out, yep. Lewin and, and, you know, Encarnacion could have, could have handled that. Miggy Rowe can go play at first base from time to time. They seem to want to give Wendell looks at short, you know, and that allows more opportunity for LeBlanc to play third. Uh, because right now we've discussed this a lot, you know, the, a lot of what the roster has been kind of interesting. Uh, but, you know, you're – it gets to the, the Jordan Groshans. You know, oh, yeah, pull him up. Well, yeah. well, where's he going to play? They need to – they need Birdie to play. He missed a bunch of time. They need Wendell to play. He missed a bunch of time. And, you know, if Wendell is part of the future, they want to see what he looks like at short maybe, see what he looks like at third. We, we want to see what LeBlanc looks like. You know, does is he fit at third? Is he better at second? You know, so we're – and then you got Garcia getting close to coming back for the outfield, and you already got Anderson in the outfield. So it's like they – you know, they, it, a lot – again, we've been down this road. Uh, you know, these they've made these calls. I still am a believer, even a guy in the down year, and you could say nobody wanted him. You, you could do all this and say all that. But the bottom line is you try to get value for every player you have, and this is a player with 93 RBIs a year ago. Um, you know, even if you had to move them in early July, uh, you know, you could have found you could have tried to find something because I, I do think this team should be in constant trade mode. And that's not always popular with our fan base who wants them to sign high price free agents and not right. lose anybody. But that's not the reality. So why not, you know, 
because we already know what's going to happen to Jesus Sanchez, and I don't care if he's hitting a buck and a quarter down at AAA. He's now out of options and has no, you know, no value, but he, he's also 24 years old. And I can tell you, I talked to a lot of people around the league, and, and there you would be very eager to see what they can do with that player. And this team is not maximizing their their players and at least getting any value, anything in return. Uh, you just can't – it has to speak to two things. One, you thought he had a playoff roster, but no one wants your players. And two, none of your, you don't even like your own players after you, these were your players you thought were going to take you to the playoffs. So, again, I could get going. I don't want to beat them up too much. Uh, but, you know, there'll come a time I beat them up more. But things have not been run very well this year. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like you said. You know, they're, they're left with a lot of guys on the roster that, quite frankly, you've got a huge log jam and you're not necessarily sure how you're going to get guys at bets. Uh, and that does bring us to a very interesting uh, – scenario where you've got Brian Anderson uh, playing in right field now. Uh, that's kind of his de facto position for the rest of the year. Uh, you have Don Mattingly saying that because of his shoulder, he doesn't want him diving around at third base. Um, he could be diving around in the outfield too, but you know, <laughs> they, they want, the bottom line is they want, they want Brian Anderson to get at bats. Um, and today he had a, you know, he had a, he had a solid performance today, drew a couple of walks, hit a home run. Uh, it does feel like the slugging is starting to come around for, for Andy a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, he's, he's an interesting, he's an interesting player for me uh, as to whether or not he's going to be on the roster in 2022, uh, you know, the, or 2023. <laughs> wow. Uh, the bat, the bat, is is intriguing but he's got to he's got to do something in the field for me to you know see enough value for him to stay on the roster because then it becomes a, a situation where it's like Garrett Cooper at, at DH all over again where the bat is good but I'm not sure if it's good enough to stand on its own for him to be a full-time DH I got Andy's got to give me some sort of some sort of value in the field well, that, this speaks to what we were just saying. You know, if you want Jordan Groshans up here, well, where is he playing? You know, because right. Brian Anderson needs to play because he's going into his final year of arbitration. I think he's making like 4.4, almost 4.5 million this year. And, you know, they seem to not want him to be a third. They think the outfield, yes, we know he can, he has a strong arm and all that, like you say. But if he's in right field, well, Garcia is probably back. Soler is probably back. You know, those guys are signed for next year. What does this mean for Bladé? What does this mean for Burdick? You know, it's like it's another scenario of now, if you're the Marlins, to me, I'm going in the offseason basically prepared to move anybody not named Sandy Alcantara. You know, and maybe next year at this time, he is being ready to move because if we're not winning enough, then you have to ask yourself if we're not going to win in the time of his contract. But for now, you know, we're going to let him win the Cy Young and we'll, we're not going to jump that far ahead. But they have to make calls on these players. Yep. So you either have to have trade value for Brian Anderson or, you know, he's either, you know, or you're going to turn over how many people, how many players are going to turn over. You know, you're going to go in next year because clearly they need to make offensive upgrades. And, you know, there seems to be you can make a case to move everyone pretty much except for Jazz, but Jazz hasn't played in the second half and and yet you there's no way you're going to replace eight players they're not going to have you know what i mean there's not right. going to be eight new players here so somebody's got to stay so are the marlins evaluating brian anderson to stay or are they building trade value or you know because he is being evaluated and we we know when he's on the field and right he's an impactful player you know i i've noted this on another podcast where he kind of had those 2018 through 20 Brian Anderson, which was very good save in 19 when he got hit in the hand and broke his hand. And then 21 and 22, 60 plus games, like, you know, about 65 or so games in both seasons because of injury, never really, you know, catching fire and being the Brian Anderson. And he's 29 years old now. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me because like you said, I, I think, I think the old Andy is still in there. Um, 
you know, at the plate. And, and it's and it feels like every time he starts to really get into a groove, he gets that's that's right when the injury button gets pushed and you know he goes on the shelf for a little while. So it's it's one of those frustrating things with him. I do think he is a guy that if they do decide to move him, uh, because he does have a track record of being a successful hitter uh, in you know in a ballpark like Lone Depot, he might be a guy that has a little bit more value, uh, you know, than maybe some people in the fan base think. Uh, he is on the last year of arbitration, so I doubt it's going to be you know anything monumental. But I do think he's a guy that other teams would probably want. Uh, and just because he is one of the guys that other teams probably want leads me to believe that he, he could be you know, he's probably not on, on the roster next season if I had to choose. Just because you got to move the guys that, you know, you can't just say, well, we'll give you Avisil Garcia with three years and, and you know, four, $39 million <laughs> remaining on this team. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not really realistic <laughs> unless you're giving up prospects as well. Yeah, and so Lair, so he, he barely played. He's going to opt yeah. out. No, yeah. no, he's not getting fifteen million next year anywhere else. And he could play the game of trade me. You know, yeah. if I'm at, if I'm really doing well, you could trade yeah. me. But I'm getting my money in the meantime. And so that's where if Andy's part of their plans, you got three corner outfielders, and none of them are named Lede or Burdick right now. You know, or if Jesus Sanchez, who you can keep, you just can't option him. You know, if you brought him into spring training, you know, you once again are are in the corners doing, you know, having players, too many players for too few spots. And but, yeah, I, I just think and this is the other thing. And I know we're going really long on Marlins. Um, they they need to make trades to get better. Yeah. And they have do they have really besides Sandy, they have anyone that you would even sell high on because there's no. You know, uh, when when Pablo was at his highest, they didn't move him. Right. You know, who knows how his season's going to end? But then everyone else, and they Garcia. You know, with, with Aggie, they couldn't trade him because his value went down. You know, Cooper's value is going down right now. Uh, you know, Anderson's value is down. Uh, you know, who are you trading outside of me? You know, Trevor Rogers' value is down. You know, uh, it's like you're, you're you're basically your biggest trade piece right now is probably Pablo. But what if you attach Pablo with Brian Anderson? Maybe you could get a return that at least brings in some, you know, some players that could be part of what you're you're building. You know, when I, I think and, and I wonder about that when when it comes to when we talk about guys values being down. There's two things that that can mean that can mean. Either A, nobody wants them, or B, we don't want to trade them for the return that we would be getting for them. And if and if it's option B, as an organization, I think they just need to swallow hard and take the medicine. Uh, because it comes to a point where if you don't deal these players, you put yourself in a much, much more difficult position where you have to manage a 26-man roster with you know 30 plus players <laughs> and, and, and you know and the math just doesn't add up at that point so i do i do think that i you know if if it's just a matter of well we don't want to we don't we think we would be trading cooper at you know his his lowest value therefore we don't want to do it because we don't like the return at some point you just have to you, you from a roster building standpoint you just have to bite the bullet and 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 you know mm-hmm. do what you can Get a get a mid level minor league or whatever you can get for some of these guys and just build the you know try to flesh out try to get through the roster building process. Well, I mean the way they're setting themselves up right now, Eric is okay. Let's say they they say because someone's going to take the fall, right? You know, so let's say it's Donnie and the coaching staff. So now you're basically saying we're going to bring back eighty percent of this roster or 85% of this roster, but new management, new manager in the coaching staff is going to bring out the best in it. Right. This is going to be year three of it because 2021, 95 losses, you know, and everyone tried to say it wasn't 95 loss team. Yeah, it was. You lost 95 games. I don't care what your run differential was now because you always could find some math. That's why the, the, the stat loving always cracks me up because 
You could find whatever. J.J. Blade hitting 200. Oh, but his way to runs created plus. We're always finding something in the stat line, you know, that, that appeals. Yet, you're not really getting the consistent production. But that's right. that's what we've kind of done. We we've seen if we like a player, we find something on that advanced stat line that we could hang our hat on. Well, the Dodgers don't work that way, and playoff no. teams don't work that way. The Atlanta Braves don't work that way. They evaluate the player and his fit and his contributions in the team and how he fits best. Not sitting around making cases for players based on. Oh well, he you know it's a low batting average, but you know, and a low slugging or or a low on base, but a high slugging. And next thing you know, you know we're we're this is our new number three hitter. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you you kind of hit that right on the head. You can only you can only evaluate guys off of off of what is there. Um, and I guess and I guess what I mean by that is, you know, you can talk about. JJ Blade, for example, and is his weighted runs created plus or, or what have you? You know, it, it's 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 nice it's nice when a guy goes you know one for one for three with a home run and a walk, uh, but when he's doing that every fourth or fifth game as opposed to you know three out of four games or because the it all comes down to consistency. And I'm not, and I'm not here to bash on a guy that's played like 30 games at the major league level. That's not what I'm here to do with JJ Blade. I, I, you know, I, I, I like his approach at the plate. I do think that there's something to work with with him. I don't think that he's a bad player by any means. But what I'm getting, what, what you're getting at, and and is it's more so an attitude within the fan base. Uh, yeah. That's that's. Prevalent, and it's and it's an attitude within the front office, I think as well, uh, because because they're hoping not to interrupt. It, yeah, you. That's they're it. they're hoping now they're insistent that this team is good, and they've been pursuant in that belief, despite the fact that the results haven't necessarily bore that out as of yet. Uh, and, and it's and it's tough when when at that level. The, the self-evaluation isn't necessarily where where it is with other teams. And, and you know, that's that's where you get to question, well, how are they going to move forward? Yeah, because keep this in mind, it's not about, and, and we do this all the time. If, uh, okay, we want Peyton Burdick or JJ, and I'm just using them as examples because yeah. before that, a year ago was Sanchi and Lewin. And then if those guys don't pan out, it's, oh, we got Groshans now. Oh, look yeah. at this. The guy had a like a I think he had an ISO of like 46 in you know for all year with Toronto in the minors. And then he goes to the Marlins and in 15 games, his slugging is good and his ISO is good. And now get him up here. He's the real deal. Won a trade. You know, it's like that's and that's not fair. It's not fair to JJ. It wasn't fair to uh, to Peyton Burdick. It's not fair to for Sanchi. We just so quickly. Yep. Think that if you hit a triple A, it's just coming right up to the big leagues and you're just going to dominate the big leagues because for 15 games, you showed more than you did before. You know, and like I bring this up, you, you, the players that usually, and it's not always because Jazz never really dominated a level, but J- Jazz is his skill set is so uniquely different because he's got amazing speed and amazing bat speed and amazing power and, and a, so athletic. But look at, you know, I don't know how Corbin Carroll is going to play because I don't know if you heard, you know, one of the top three prospects is being called up by Arizona. Go look at his AAA number. Because he's already in AA this year. Look at his numbers this year. He dominated a level. He didn't have just a low batting average, high home runs. Uh, It was dominant. 320-ish batting averages, 1,000 OPS, 20 bombs, 10 – you know, it's like – dominated a level and that's kind of what usually the the players that can dominate a level like that you know stanton when he was 20 years old yeah dominated levels jose fernandez dominated levels you know these are the players that come to the big leagues and usually perform or if they don't they take their lumps a little bit but they're also pretty darn young um and and they come up and, and they get it going it's not just a half a stat was oh man one little category he walks a lot 
So yep. he has a high OBP. He's our guy. I mean, and, and, and the harsh reality is the Marlins just don't have those guys right now. Um, that's that's uh, on the position player side of things. Yeah, Yuri is the, you know, Yuri, Yuri, is the Yuri is that guy. Don't yeah, yeah. He, he absolutely is that guy. I mean, the only guy that you can really make an argument for, and he really isn't thought of as you know that highly of a prospect, at least you know according to pipeline, is Gerard. What Gerard was doing in Double A earlier this year, uh, but like you 